Good morning, Walden Church, and Merry Christmas. We are in the season of Advent. This is uh, something we celebrate on the church calendar, and the word Advent, it means coming, or it means arrival. So the focus then of the Christmas season is the celebration of the arrival of Jesus Christ. Christmas would have been his first Advent, right? His first arrival. And it's also the anticipation then of his second coming, his second arrival. Advent also symbolizes the spiritual journey that we take as a church. And the holiday season affirms that Christ has come, that he is present in this world today, and that he will come again. Advent is a double focus. You know, as we look back and as we remember the past through these Christmas stories, we also look ahead to our glorious future. In fact, the very first Christmas was already a time when people were looking to the future. And so in our scripture today, we're going to peek into a story that tells of a people who are yearning to be rescued from all of the darkness that's in the world and how those people looked forward with expectation, how they looked forward with anticipation, with longing. Advent is the hope that God will send a new king, that he will rule with truth and justice and mercy over all his people and over creation. So it's the hope that we receive an anointed one, a Messiah, who's going to bring peace and righteousness to the world. We're going to stay in our book of Luke, and I'm really excited to bring you the word today. We're actually going to start in verse 5 of chapter 1. It says, In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. I don't know if you can picture this, but Luke begins his story by turning off the lights and taking a flashlight and bending over and saying this phrase, during the rule of King Herod. <laughs> it's not a happy opening line. The name Herod would shed shivers down your spine. Herod is 60 years old when Jesus is born. Herod had murdered both his brother-in-laws and his mother-in-law and his wife. So he's a crazy person. <laughs> but get this, Herod had also ordered that upon his own death, many rich people and famous people would be gathered into the Hippodrome and that they would be murdered, slaughtered on the day of his death. Why? Just so that everybody in town would cry. He wanted there to be crying on the day of his death. So when you have an opening line like this, during the rule of King Herod, you kind of have to read it like that. Herod's kind of like a mafia don. I mean, sure, there's peace in the area, but it was a peace that was built on fear. It was built on bloodshed. So the story of Jesus's birth, it takes place in very dark times. It takes place in a time when the people need to be rescued from these leaders. Verse 5 says, In the days of King Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron. And her name was Elizabeth, and they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. So our first two story players in this particular story, right, are Zechariah and Elizabeth. Zechariah was a member of the 24 priestly divisions, and his division was named Abijah. His wife is also of a priestly family. So right away, we understand this is a holy family, right? This is a devout family. This is a family that has very strong ties to the Old Testament and tradition. During his duties, Zechariah draws what is known as the third lot, 
And this earns him a once in a lifetime opportunity to go into the sanctuary and to burn incense. This is a very special role. Uh, it's very holy, very honored, very prized role. Zechariah is gonna enter into God's presence. He's gonna go behind the veil of the inner sanctum. He's gonna go into the Holy of Holies. And since uh, only one person was allowed inside, this chosen person would spend hours cleaning in ritual baths. They would put on pure white garments and they would spend hours in silent meditation. And even then, it was still a dangerous thing because Zachariah was entering into God's presence. What if he made a mistake? What if he did the wrong thing? What if he saw God's face? He could die. So for protection, the priests would tie a long rope around the person's ankle. And the priestly garments were covered with little tiny bells so that they jingled when he walked. So that if perchance he was struck dead by God while he was inside, the other priests could pull the rope and pull his corpse out so that they didn't have to enter into the Holy of Holies themselves. So you can picture this. Zachariah is walking slowly into a room that is dark, it's very ominous, a place he's never been before, probably, or if he has, visited very rarely. His heart's racing, and he's thinking very carefully about what he is supposed to do. And his vision would probably even be blocked by billows of smoke and incense. And it's inside of that environment. Verse 11 says, and there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Yeah. <laughs> you know how you think when you're alone in the room and then all of a sudden you see another person standing there, but they're quiet <laughs> and, they're, and there's probably smoke billowing around you. That would scare you. That would scare anybody. Verse 13 says, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zachariah, for your prayer has been heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit of the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wise of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. But when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among the people. Remember earlier, I noted that Zechariah and Elizabeth were both from priestly families. They're very devout people. But up until this point, they have been unable to have children. But also remember that this angel begins with, your prayers have been heard. Typically in this time, not being able to have kids was a sign that there was some sort of sin in your life or perhaps this was a punishment. And people on the outside looking into your family would perhaps gossip and they would make wild speculation about you. This is why Elizabeth says her reproach is removed. Now watch where this angel goes next. Verse 26, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. 
And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be called Great, and will be called Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child, to be born, will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this in the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now, this word for angel in the scriptures, it is the same word as the word messenger. One of our own Christmas songs that we sing very often is, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, right? Which is a redundant title (laughs) for a song because an angel is already a herald. So it's literally, listen, the messenger, messenger sings. (laughs) So when this messenger approaches Mary, we, we don't know the context. The Bible doesn't say doesn't say if this angel has wings or bright lights or halos or flowing robes. The Bible simply says a messenger came to her and said, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. And then the Bible records a very typical human response. She was greatly troubled at the saying and she tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. Imagine that this happens to you. You probably would wave sheepishly back. Hi. (laughs) She, like Zachariah, is a little shocked. It's, It's a lot to take in. So in this first chapter of Luke, remember, we have a story, right, that's written by a doctor, a doctor who wishes to write for us a very factual, very orderly account. We've just read about two angel sightings and two birth announcements, both of which seem highly unlikely. The first, Elizabeth. She's old, she's barren. She and Zachariah have never known the joys of being parents. The second, Mary. She's the complete opposite. She's young, she's never even been married. And both of these birth announcements are received differently. Our story takes place in two different places with two very different people. In the first chapter of Luke, We have two visitations from the angel. And notice the differences in reaction and in the belief from Zechariah to Mary. Because at first glance, it might appear that both of these people doubt the messenger. But a closer look reveals something different, and I think that's key. First, when the angel tells Zechariah that he will have a son, Zechariah says, how can I be sure? That sounds like doubt because the angel hears his doubt, right? And pushes back with, how can you be sure? Uh, Because I'm an angel. (laughs) I'm an angel and I live with God and he sent me to tell you, that's how you can be sure. Next, the angel tells Mary that she will have a son and she says, how can this be? In other words, how is this going to happen? She's not doubting. She's just asking a very technical question. (laughs) She wants to know how the process is going to go down because you kind of need a man and a woman and then they go on a date and, well, you get the picture. I don't think that Mary is doubting that it will happen. She's just asking about logistics. Plus, we don't know where Mary is when she has this encounter. We know where Zachariah is, but we don't know where Mary is. I've seen in movies where she's picking flowers under a tree or she's going off to get water or she's walking to the market. She could have been walking down the road. She's approached in a strange way. And not once does the messenger ever say, I'm from God, or give any indication that this is some sort of supernatural event. And yet Mary believes, right? She believes. For whatever reason, Her heart is open. She hears the words, she understands, and then she says, 
I am the Lord's servant. That's amazing. And that's why her story is so amazing. Because unlike you or me, she responds right away with absolute trust. She immediately recognizes goodness and light. And when I compare the two, I would probably act more like Zachariah. Zachariah, who basically walks into God's bedroom <laughs> with a rope around his ankle, just in case if he accidentally sees God, and what happens? He has a heavenly encounter. Go figure. <laughs> in the Holy of Holies, right? Of course. But his response is, how do I know this is true? Do you see the irony? Plus, he's a priest. Because on top of all of this, who is Mary? She's a nobody. She's a local teenager. In the most holiest room in all of Jewish culture, Zechariah doesn't believe. He is literally walking into the presence of God, and then something otherworldly happens, something supernatural takes place, and he doesn't believe. Mary, on the other hand, surrenders her life. This is how the Christmas story begins. It begins with amazing faith. Mary hears the words of the angel and she surrenders her life and her destiny and all her hopes and her body to God. And then these two worlds come together. In verse 39 it says, In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with loud joy, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. You know, N.T. Wright said, God's purposes and plans are first revealed in a private meeting between two women on the edge of society. And what do we see Mary do next? Mary sings. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant, for behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. Mary is so overwhelmed that it comes out of her as a song. And her song, interestingly enough, is about the reversal of power. Did you notice that? Verse 5 begins with, During the rule of King Herod. And by the time we get to verse 52, we get, He has pulled down the powerful from their thrones, and he has lifted up the lowly. The arc to this story is changing. The mood of this story is changing. The Christmas story begins in dark times with sad people, with an oppressed rule, and now we have one of those characters singing with hope. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty-handed. He has come to the aid of his servant Israel. And then it says, now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. So what's happening in this story is everything the angels said is coming true, right? We know the story is true because Luke told us. Luke told us that he spoke to eyewitnesses. This is a true story. This is not a movie. This is not a fairy tale. Luke says, I researched this. 
I wrote it down so that you would know the truth, so that you would know the Christmas story. It continues saying, and her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him Zechariah after his father. But his mother answered, no, he shall be called John. And they said to her, none of your relatives is called by this name. And they made signs to the father, inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, his name is John. And they all wondered, and immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed, and he spoke, blessing God. Ladies, this would have been a wonderful gift, right? Through all nine months of your pregnancy, your husband can't talk. <laughs> Honey, can you get me some ice cream? What's that? I don't hear you. Oh, you love me and you do anything for me? Thank you, honey. Right? And then for the first time in almost a year, Zachariah, who couldn't speak, what does he do? Zachariah sings. And his father Zachariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his prophets from old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Remember, verse five, how does this story begin? During the time of King Herod, right? And by the time we get to verse 74, we hear, he has brought salvation from our enemies and from the power of all who hate us. Zachariah's song is a lot like Mary's song. It's about the reversal of power, about a change in the wind. It's a story that starts one way and ends another. This is the Christmas miracle of glory touching earth. At first you're thinking, these are the worst days to be alive. And then, through the darkness, you hear two voices. They are singing a duet in the midnight air. One, an old man. The other, a young girl. And both of them, in love with God and looking forward with hope to the days that are coming. In verse 74, Zechariah says that in these coming days, we will serve the Lord without fear. That's also interesting to note. You know, just nine months earlier, he went into the Holy of Holies. He was afraid for his life because that was the relationship between God and people. That's how it had always been. In the book of Exodus, God tells Moses multiple times that anybody who looks on him or who even touches the mountain will die. In 2 Samuel 6, there was a man named Uzzah, and he dies because he tries to reach out and steady the ark when he thinks it's going to fall off a cart, and God kills him. That was the relationship. God was scary. God was to be feared. God, God is distant, and he lives far, far, far away. But the Christmas story says, not anymore. Zacharias sings, that was then, this is now. No longer will we worship God in fear. And he says, my son John will tell God's people how to be saved through the forgiveness of their sins. And he says, the dawn from heaven will break upon us to give light to those who are sitting in darkness and the shadow of death to guide us on the path of peace. If that's not the beginning of an amazing story, I don't know what is. Oh, 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 one more thing. Zachariah's song and Mary's song both use the same word 
a few times in the original language, and it's the word hesed, H-E-S-E-D. Mary sings, he shows mercy to everyone. He has come to the aid of his servant Israel, remembering his mercy. Zechariah sings, he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and remembered his holy covenant. It's almost the same lyric. Both singers sing about mercy. They're singing about hesed. But to be truthful, the Hebrew understanding of hesed, it's not really, it's not really simply defined as mercy. I consider the following to be a good working definition of what hesed means. Hesed is the consistent, ever faithful, relentless, constantly pursuing, lavish, extravagant, unrestrained, furious love of God. It's this. It's this. It's this love. It's this mercy, right, that was demonstrated by the birth of our Savior that so radically changes the world, so radically changes our lives. It's the song about the reversal of power, right? It's about the, the new hope that we all look forward to, this coming that we all look forward to. This is why we celebrate Christmas. Herod was a king. He brought peace through bloodshed. Jesus was a king. He brought peace through his blood. Right? The world Zechariah and Mary live in is hopeless and it's dark, it's oppressive, and tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow doesn't look any better. And then the story changed. God sent a gift of mercy. He sent a little present of love. And in just one chapter, the people are filled with joy and confidence and they sing. They sing about the source of life and they celebrate life in a way that they have never done before. The Christmas story, we have a, we have a collision. We have two kingdoms. We have two different powers, two different glories, two different means to bring peace. And I think the Christmas story starts by asking us, what world would you rather live in? I mean, sure, you and I live, we live in the greatest country on earth, right? But that doesn't mean that we don't have some people that still live in fear or who still live in darkness. Remember, Luke's Christmas story begins with oppression. And for some people today, finances are oppressive. They, they shackle you. You become a slave to credit cards. You become a slave to your identity and what you do for a living. You work to live and you live to work and you fill your house and you fill your garage with all kinds of treasures so people on the outside will admire you. For some people today, emotions are oppressive. You're easily angered, quick to be hot-tempered, and you don't know why you feel so much. And then for others, it's the exact opposite. They feel nothing. Their lives are empty, their lives are hollow, and they try to fill their life with all kinds of artificial joy. And they turn to addictions, and they turn to gossip, and they turn to sex, and they would do anything just to feel something for some people, all of life is oppressive. It's overwhelming. You have kids and bills and career, and it never ends. It never ends. <laughs> it never ends. And so the Christmas story asks, which world do you want to live in? Do you want to live in the world that is bound by oppression, or do you want to live in a world where the mercy of God sets you free? For Mary and Zechariah, the mercy of Christmas broke into their lives. First, Zachariah says, no way. Really? And Mary says, yes. <laughs> she says, let me have it, right? This Christmas, Jesus comes for us. He comes as the hero to the story. He comes to the, as the rescuer from oppression. He comes to us as the savior that we all need. My prayer for you this Christmas is that your life would be gripped by his said, this, this God love, this God mercy, and that you cast yourself completely onto the one who is all goodness and who is all light. You see, the great thing about our Savior is you don't need to know everything. You don't even need to know the answers. You just need to know that you need saving. 
And if you felt that oppression, if you felt that fear for tomorrow, then you know. You know you can't do life alone. You know, and, and there's no shame in that. You know, there's no shame in admitting that you can't do it on your own, that you can't do it by your, by your own strength. People who are locked up, they can't break out of prison on their own. People who are drowning can't save themselves. So it would be my greatest joy to introduce you to the mercy of God on this sacred day of Advent. I hope you will decide that a life with Jesus as your rescuer is better than any tomorrow without him. I hope that that's the life you want. And if it is, then I would invite you right now, where you are, to bow your head and pray this prayer. Dear God, thank you for sending your son Jesus so that I could be your friend. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for being with me all my life, even when I didn't know it. And I realize I need a savior to set me free from sin and from myself and from all the habits and hurts and hangups that mess up my life. And I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I want to repent and I want to live the way you created me to live. Be the Lord of my life. Save me with grace. I want to learn to love you and trust you and become everything that you made me to be. Thank you for creating me and choosing me to be a part of your family. This first chapter in Luke is a brand new day, right? Christmas is the celebration of glory touching earth. And just like winter snow that covers the ground, this promised child is going to cover all the darkness. Thanks for hanging out with us today. I hope you had a blessed morning. I want to remind you that we have church services every single Sunday. We have two services, one at 9.30. It's a traditional service. We sing hymns, we have a choir. And then at 11 o'clock, we have a contemporary service with a worship team. We also have childcare. We also have a youth program. We'd love to have you participate. Also, I want to let you know our Christmas concert is coming up. Our Christmas concert is on December 12th, and it's at 10 o'clock in the morning on Sunday. December 12th, 10 o'clock, come and see our concert. It's open for the entire community. It's free. Our choir has been working on this all year, and we would love to have you come and be a part of that. It is our Christmas gift to you. Thank you, guys. I love you. I'll see you next week. Bye.